The real beneficiaries of this revolution will be the developing world. We need to remember with all the talk of globalization, 25% of our fellow human beings have never, ever, ever had electricity. And another 30% have occasional access. It's not dependable. And if we couldn't get it to them at $3 a barrel, we're not going to get it to them at 80 a barrel. We need to ripen these technologies in the developed countries quickly, and then a massive financial transfer, not what they're talking about in Cape, Copenhagen, $100 billion, please. We need trillions and trillions done smart with public-private investment, with open partnership between the developed and the developing worlds quickly overnight. The real beneficiaries of the carbon deposits of the Jurassic Age are the Northern Hemisphere nations. The first victims of climate change, as you know, are south of the equator. There should be solar roofs and vertical wind and heat pumps and recycling garbage and ocean waste everywhere. Then we can have re-globalization from the bottom up. Then energy can be local and no one has to rely on the geopolitics of OPEC or somewhere else. Then we create a more peaceful planet. It's power to the people. Let me say, in the last few minutes, I want to completely change focus here. I think this is a decent game plan. This can be put together. Let me explain how we're doing it. Uh, we founded uh, an organization last year. It's a network that I chair. It's called the Third Industrial Revolution Global CEO Business Roundtable. It's 100 CEOs of the major European and American companies and cooperatives together. Companies and cooperatives, the major CEOs in all four pillars, the major renewable energy companies, pillar one, the major big construction and real estate companies in both sides of the Atlantic, pillar two, three, the major storage technology companies, four, the major IT companies like IBM and Siemens and Kima up here, Pierre Nobbers, uh, Rudy Provos is on our group from Philips Lighting up here, the head of Philips, and we have the utility companies like Essen and NTR, et cetera, et cetera. What we are doing now is we've realized no more pilots, no more sectioning off. We've got to get around that bureaucracy, and we've got to lay down all four pillars in every major urban area simultaneously with a well-thought-out plan. And here's the difficulty. The old system on life support, we can't let it collapse. But we've got to find a way to keep it on life support, but move our vested interest in laying out a new infrastructure with a completely business, new business model at the same time. So our global team is now working with cities and regions, and now the first big national governments, collaboratively. This only works in cities and regions that have well-developed expertise, because their best experts come together with our global experts, and we lay down a collaborative master plan. We just did San Antonio, the seventh largest U.S. city. $800 million a year in economic development. That's only 5% of their development funds. A staged-in transition in 20 years. We just finished Monaco for Prince Albert. And tonight, I go to Rome this afternoon. And this week, the great city of Rome, we're bringing all the business leaders together tonight, the political leaders. And over the next four days, our global team and the Italy's global best team in Rome, every major department, transport, urban, logistics, housing, everything, we're going to lay down a master plan collaboratively and on March 1st introduce a 30-year plan for the transition of Rome. This can be done in every single metropolitan region. It requires that each region here be up to speed. You are all the flagship regions. You have enough expertise already to do this. Then it requires collaborating and sharing best practices and customizing and helping each other. This is a collaborative venture. Then we have to lay down these infrastructures, and each time you lay one, then you become the experts and go to other regions and help them. Do you follow me? So it isn't just a few of us, because everyone has to help everyone else to get there in time. So if Rotterdam or Amsterdam or Utrecht is moving and gets that four-pillar infrastructure in place, then your job is to go and make sure your expertise is shared with the other regions. Does this make sense? This is way beyond Copenhagen. This turns despair to hope, and we create an economic plan. But here's what I want to say to you. I really don't think we're going to get there even with this plan by itself. I think this plan is common sense. This isn't rocket science. We know we have to go to renewables. The buildings will collect them. We're going to store them with various storage technologies, mostly hydrogen. We're going to put in smart grids and, and, and uh, plug-in transport. But there has to be some other change. 
Unless we change human consciousness quickly, we can't get there. We have to go from denial to acceptance, and then we have to go from geopolitics to biosphere awareness overnight in one generation that separates you from your kids. We have to think as homo sapiens. We can never be focused on the same page to get through this door unless we think as a single human race. You say to me, how do we do this? What's interesting is when communication and energy revolutions converge in history, they actually change consciousness. It's a built-in little goody. Every forager hunter society, that was their energy regime, foraging, hunting, had oral communication, and their consciousness based on their communication was always mythological. We've never seen a forager hunter society that still exists that didn't have mythological consciousness. When we went to the great hydraulic civilizations and writing, we created the great monotheistic religions, the people of the book, the Abrahamic religions and then Confucianism in the East. When we went to the first industrial revolution and print literacy, the, way, the, the brain was wired again for ideological consciousness, sense and sensibility, rationalism and romantic response. When we went to the electricity revolution, the second industrial revolution, we went to psychological consciousness in the 20th century. My great-grandparents and grandparents couldn't think therapeutically at all. Everyone in this room understands how to analyze their feeling in relation to everyone else's. We couldn't have done that without the electricity revolution as metaphor. Our kids now and the young people in this room and the millennial generation, with the third industrial revolution, you're beginning to stretch the technology so the central nervous system is connected to the whole world. This means it is now possible to create biosphere consciousness. The revolution in the last 10 years, check it out in the grade schools. Your 12-year-old comes home from school and she says, Mom, we got to turn off the electricity when we're not using it. Why? Because the more electricity we use, the more CO2 goes up there. And a farmer in Africa it then experiences drought from the CO2 and can't feed their family, correct? That's a sea change in consciousness, knowing that our behavior affects everyone else in a single species and our fellow creatures. That's happened in less than 20 years. It's happened in 10. So we have to think globally. We have to think eh, consciously. Now, let me give you what I think the hope is. Here's the despair. The reason we are having a problem and all of you are frustrated because you're leading this and no one seems to be following you yet and you're knocking on the door every day, even in your own administrations. I know what's going on and you're trying to get a little bit more time, and you're in pilot projects, and you're tearing your hair out. <laughs> if it all depends on what we think human nature is about and what the human journey is about. You know, for 1,700 years, we believed that little babies are born evil and depraved and full of sin. We did. So a lot of people still do. In the Enlightenment, when we went to the market economy and the nation state, our Enlightenment philosophers changed the game. And John Locke said, no, you're born tabula rasa, except, little compromise, for the propensity to acquire property. That's kind of built in. <laughs> he made a compromise. Adam Smith said, we're born to pursue our material self-interest in the market. That's classical economic theory. He still teaches it at the Wharton School. And then Jeremy Bentham tempered it by saying, we're born for utility. We seek pleasure over pain. Charles Darwin said, we're born simply to reproduce ourselves. And Freud the most pathological of the group. He said, that little baby's born full of erotic desire that needs to be extinguished. It's all libido. Now, how many parents are in this room? Parents. When that little baby's looking at you, are they saying, hmm, how do I pursue my self-interest, my pleasure, my libido? Is that what they're saying to you? Let me tell you about a little experiment that'll give you hope. Back in the 1990s in Italy, there was a teeny little laboratory and they were studying macaque monkeys and they had MRIs on the monkey. So one monkey, they're watching how the hand movements try to open up a nut. And the monkey's getting frustrated trying to open the nut and certain neurons light up in the brain. Nothing much going on. By sheer happenstance, a trainer walks in a few minutes later and takes the nut, not knowing, and tries to open it up himself. Same emotions, feelings, and frustrations the monkey's just looking at him, not moving. But all of a sudden, the same neurons lit up when he was observing the trainer as when he was going through the feelings himself. And they said, what is this? 